In the second of five presentations, we're going to be looking at recombinant DNA technology. Today's presentation has five learning objectives. Number one, to compare and contrast the elements used in DNA technology to their natural biological roles. And this is going to include things like plasmids, restriction enzymes, and DNA ligase. Two, to explain the features of plasmids that enable them to be used as cloning vectors. Three, to predict the results of restriction endonuclease treatment of DNA. Four, to describe the process of cloning a eukaryotic gene into a prokaryotic cell, including examples. And five, to interpret the results of transformation experiments, importantly, including controls. But let's start off here. What do you think that these people have in common? Tom Hanks, Halle Berry, Selma Hayek, and Drew Carey. We're going to come back to this a little bit later in the talk. For today, we're going to be focusing on this idea of why would we want to go about cloning genes? What do we want to use that cloning for? And what's up with Tom Hanks? So why do we want to clone genes? There's lots of reasons for this. So, for instance, you might want to understand how biological systems work. Um, and this is used a lot uh, where we're trying to understand how biological systems work in a research laboratory setting. It might also be that you want to develop new medical treatments. And there's even uses for commercial applications, although those are often more contentious. And there are many other uses as well. If we just look at the medical applications, recombinant proteins are used to treat a number of different disorders. So, for instance, Factor VIII is used to treat haemophilia. Glucagon is used to treat hyperglycemia. The hepatitis B surface antigen is used uh, in vaccines against hepatitis B. And interferon is often used as a treatment for leukemia. So it's very, very common to use recombinant technologies in a whole lot of medical settings. Today we're going to be talking about this figure quite a lot. So this is a summary figure that describes essentially how you get uh, genes from one organism into another. And we're going to break this down over the course of, of the presentation and look at it piece by piece. To start with, we're going to be looking at this particular section. So uh, plasmids and bacterial chromosomes. So a key feature of creating genetically modified organisms are these things called plasmid vectors. And it's important to recognize that plasmas are natural things. So here we've got a, a perfectly natural bacterium that's been put into um, a salt solution. So basically we've blown up the cell, it's exploded. And so what you can see are all these loops and swirls, and they're the DNA from, from the bacterium. Most of those swoops and swirls are DNA from the bacterial chromosome. But if you look very closely, there are bits of DNA up in the upper right of this particular figure that are circular and separated from the other DNA, and these are plasmids. Bacterial plasmids are these small, circular, double-stranded DNA that only contain a relatively small number of genes. Importantly, they replicate independently of the bacterial chromosome, and depending on the setting, a bacterium might contain a number of different plasmids. But how do we take plasmids from a natural setting and how do we use them in the lab? There are a number of problems when we're trying to create genetically modified organisms in the test tube. And so we use these things called plasmid vectors. The first problem you have to um, address is that the gene of interest, the gene that you want to take from another organism, has to be inserted into the plasmid. And we use this, um, we do this using a thing called a multiple cloning site for inserting the foreign gene, and this is a series of restriction enzyme cut sites that allow us to open up the plasmid and insert the gene that we're interested in. The second problem that we have to face is that the foreign gene, this gene that we've taken from somewhere else, has to be replicated. And so the, the plasmid vector contains this, this bit of DNA called an origin of replication, which is where the polymerase binds to make multiple copies of this plasmid vector. And the third thing we need is that transformants have to be selected. 
Um, so we, we want to get plasmids that contain the gene of interest, our foreign gene, and not anything else. So the way we do this is by using a selectable marker. In this particular case, the example we're giving is one of ampicillin resistance genes, so an AMPR gene, which allows us to select for plasmids that contain the gene of interest. So let's look at this particular part of the summary figure. So here we're going to be looking at how do you get your gene of interest inserted into, um, into a plasmid vector. We do this using restriction endonucleases. So we, we saw these in the last presentation. A restriction enzyme or restriction endonuclease, the terms are, are the same, they cut at a specific symmetric sequence, such as GAATTC. You can think of them effectively as molecular scissors. We also need this thing called DNA ligase. Now, DNA ligase links DNA fragments together. You can think of it as molecular glue. It is, again, a natural part of the DNA replication and repair system, and it joins the small fragments of the lagging strand doing DNA replication. So when you're replicating the DNA in your own body, one of the strands, the polymerase, just uh, walks along the strand and, and makes uh, the new DNA strand. Absolutely no problem at all, just keeps on going. But the other one is sort of out of kilter. It has to be made in small fragments. And those fragments are joined together by DNA ligase. But how do we use the molecular scissors and molecular glue, so restriction enzymes and DNA ligase in the lab? Well, first of all, we have to use the restriction enzymes to cut the DNA sugar phosphate backbone at the position of the arrow. So here we've got a bacterial plasmid vector. It's got a restriction site, and we cut it with the molecular scissors, and so it's broken up into two pieces. The second step is that we've got another DNA molecule containing the foreign gene, the gene of interest, and that has to be cut with the same restriction enzyme. Because they're cut with the same restriction enzyme, the base pairs have these things called sticky ends. So if you look at either the green or the pink examples, you see that there's often this AATT or TTAA overhang. And they can just join up. They just naturally join up um, to stick the, the, the DNA of containing your gene of interest into the, um, into the plasmid. But at the moment, Although it's stuck in the right place, it's not physically joined together. You don't have a covalent bond on the DNA backbone. And so this is where DNA ligase comes in. DNA ligase joins the strands together. And this creates the final recombinant DNA that contains DNA from two sources. In this case, the bacterium, shown in green, and say, a human or some other organism, shown in pink. How do you get those copies of the foreign genes? Well, they can be obtained in multiple ways. A very common way, though, is by PCR amplification. You can use uh, primers for PCR that contain restriction sites matching those in the cloning vector. So then you basically cut your PCR products with the restriction enzyme to get the sticky ends, and then they can get put into the cloning vector, mixed and ligated, uh, and to create a recombinant DNA plasma, just as we've already talked about. Let's take a look at this last part of the figure. So this is how you get a recombinant bacterium and how you express proteins from your gene of interest. A key feature that you need is selectable markers. So here we're looking at an antibiotic called ampicillin. So ampicillin breaks down the bacterial cell wall and kills the cell. But there's a protein, an enzyme, that's encoded by the ampicillin resistance gene, AMPAR, which destroys ampicillin. So bacteria can only survive ampicillin if they have the AMPAR gene. So what we do is we transform or clone bacteria with this recombinant DNA that we've just made in the previous section. Now, not all cells are going to contain the cloning vector. You know, it's a very rare event. So how do we select for those cells that do contain it? 
The trick is that we plate the cells out on medium containing ampicillin. So this selects for cells with resistance to ampicillin, okay, those that contain the plasmid and the selectable marker, the ampar gene, which inhibits cell wall, uh, which inhibits the ampicillin, which breaks down the cell wall. Cells with the resistance gene grow, and those cells that do not contain the gene, they die. So what you get is, in this particular case, only two of those cells can propagate and grow and form a colony, bacterial colony, that we can then use um, to, to, to do different things with. Okay, here's a class discussion. So what we've got here are two different bits of DNA. On the top we've got the human genomic DNA containing the HGH, or human growth hormone gene. And in the bottom we've got a plasmid vector, plasmid DNA, with a selectable marker, an origin of replication, and multiple cloning sites. What we want to do is clone the entire human uh, growth hormone gene into the bacterial plasmid. The question is, which enzyme should we use to cut both the plasmid and the human genomic DNA? So here's a few different examples. Which one do you think is the right one? Stop the video, think about this for a moment, and then restart the video. So the answer is B, BAMH1. So let's walk through the other examples. So option A is PVU2, and this isn't any good because it cuts in the middle of the HGH gene, right? So we don't want that gene cut, it needs to be contained. We want it to cut on either side, not in the middle, so that's not going to work. Option C is HINDI3, and again, this is not going to work for the same reason. There's a cut site in the middle of the gene that we want, the HGH gene. Option D looks more promising, so this is ECOR1, and this has got cut sites on either side of the HGH gene. That looks good. But if you look at the, um, the plasmid vector, you'll see there's an ECOR1 site right in the middle of the selectable marker and the ampar gene. So that's going to cut the ampar gene and cut your, your plasmid DNA in the wrong place. That's not what we want. So D isn't an option. And then E also has ECOR1 and therefore is also not an option. So what we do want is BAMH1, option B. BAMH1 has got cut sites on either side of the HGH gene, and it also has a single cut site in the multiple cloning site of the plasmid. Here's another class discussion. Which statement about the selectable marker gene for ampicillin resistance on a plasmid is true? A, the ampicillin resistant gene can break down ampicillin in the agar. B, the presence of the gene allows the plasmid to be resistant to ampicillin. C, the presence of the gene allows the bacterium to be resistant to ampicillin. Or D, the ampicillin resistance gene can only provide ampicillin resistance when it becomes part of the bacterial chromosome. Think about this for a moment, stop the video, and uh, figure out what the answer is. In this particular case, the answer is C. The presence of the gene allows the bacterium to be resistant to ampicillin. So why are the other answers not true? Well, A, the ampicillin resistant gene can break down ampicillin in the agar. Well, that's not true. It's not in the agar. The ampicillin resistant gene is actually in the bacterium. B, the presence of the gene allows the plasmid to be resistant to ampicillin. Here, it's not the plasmid that becomes resistant to ampicillin. It is the bacterium. So the plasma does contain the resistance gene, but it, that gene allows the bacterium to become resistant to ampicillin, which is the answer in C. In D, ampicillin resistant gene can only provide ampicillin resistance when it becomes part of the bacterial chromosome. That's not true. The, the, uh, the resistant gene always stays in the plasmid. It never integrates with the bacterial chromosome. That's not a necessary condition. So the answer here is C. So here's another class discussion. We've got a number of different plates with bacterial colonies grown on. So on the top we've got uh, student 1, and the bottom we've got student 2. On the left we've got cells plus plasmid DNA, and on the right we've got a cells only control. So what we've got here are two students who have transformed the E. coli cells with plasmid DNA. They plated the transformed cells on the left, and a cells only, no DNA control, right onto agar containing ampicillin. After incubating the plates at 37 degrees, um, the students get these particular results. So the question is, 
which student has the expected result and what has the other student done wrong. So stop the video, think about this for a moment and then restart the video. So the student with the correct result is student one. You've got uh, some colonies on the cells plus plasma DNA plate, but you've got no colonies on the cells only control because that's got ampicillin in it, so it's going to kill off all the cells. So what's happened here for student two? There could be a number of things. The student may have forgotten to put ampicillin in the, um, in the agar. They may have put too little ampicillin in there. They may have plated cells with plasma DNA on both of the plates. Um, this just illustrates the importance of putting controls in so you can get, to, get a bit of an indication about what has potentially gone wrong. So here's another example, student three. They've done the same experiment, but what has student three done wrong? Stop the video here, have a think about it, and then see if your answer matches mine. So student three has got no colonies on their plate. Again, there could be a number of reasons for this. They may have plated the cells only control on both of the plates. They might have put so much ampicillin in that it's killed off all the cells, even those that contain the ampicillin resistance gene. It may be that they plated no cells onto the plates at all. Again, this just emphasizes the importance of having both positive controls and negative controls. Here's another class discussion. Here we've got a plasmid cut with EcoR1, and they've inserted the EcoR1 uh, sticky ends of, of a gene, and they've ligated it in. So you've gone from plasmid A, which contains no uh, gene inserted, to plasmid B, which contains an inserted gene. You then decide to check the plasmid in the colonies. How many DNA fragments would you see if you cut with a plasmid A with EcoR1, and the recombinant plasmid B also with EcoR1. So what I want you to do is consider where the bands would be on this agarose gel shown on the right. Stop the video, have a bit of a think about the banding patterns and what they might be, and then start the video to see if you're correct. So here is the expected banding patterns. In both cases, you would expect to see um, the entire plasmid showing up as a single large band if you cut with EcoR1. The difference is that for, for lane B or for plasmid B, you would also see a smaller band containing the inserted gene of interest. So one band, one large band for, for uh, plasmid A, the same large band for plasmid B, but also in addition, uh, a smaller gene band. All right, let's add some complexity to this. So in the, in the real world, you often have a number of problems, but we've also developed solutions for them. So one problem is that the foreign gene might be eukaryotic and so contain introns. So these are non-coding bits of DNA that interrupt the coding sequence of a gene. So how would you get around this? In this particular case, you could use complementary DNA, so cDNA made from the mRNA. Um, this is where the introns have been spliced out and so now you've got the complete coding sequence without any interruptions. A second problem might be that your eukaryote promoter doesn't work in bacteria. In that particular case you may need to use a bacterial prokaryotic promoter instead. A third potential problem is that the eukaryotic protein might only function when it's glycosylated. So glycosylation is when sugar groups are stuck to the outside of the protein. And often this can make the difference between a protein that is functional and a protein that is not. In this particular case, you may simply not be able to, to uh, transform the gene into a, into a bacteria. You might have to transform it into a eukaryotic host, such as yeast in order to get a functional protein out the other end. All right, so let's come back to our original discussion. Here we've got four people, Tom Hanks, Halle Berry, Selma Hayek, Drew Carey. What do these people have in common? The answer is 
they all have diabetes. Diabetes is interesting as it is treated with um, a particular protein called insulin, which you're looking at here rotating on the right. The demand for insulin in a medical setting is absolutely huge. There's large numbers of people who have diabetes, and in fact, you'll probably know of people in your own families or, or friends or neighbors who have it. Because of the demand from insulin, almost all insulin used around the world today is made using recombinant technologies and essentially using all of the techniques that we've discussed in this presentation. In the next presentation, we're going to be talking about genetically modified organisms in a little bit more detail than we have in this presentation today. So before the next presentation, if you have the book, you should read up about genetically modified organisms in Campbell, page 432 to 439, and also read a bit about CRISPR-Cas9 in Campbell, page 426 to 427. If you don't have the Campbell textbook, you can read up about these particular techniques online, or we're going to talk about them in the next presentation.